Welcome back, everybody, to a little less for your podcast. Today, I am interviewing somebody all the way from the UK. Thank you. Welcome to a little less for your podcast. And lo and behold, his last name is Almagor. Actually, his full name is Rafael Cohen Almagor. And Almagor, Almagor translates to uh, less fear, which just happens to be a little less fear podcast. I mean, I feel like we're quite aligned right here. And uh, let's see here. Well, I'm reading from his biography online, and it looks like he's published extensively in the fields of politics, philosophy, ethics, law, education, sociology, and history. In these, value, in these various fields of study, a large part of Raphael's research focuses on Israeli politics, society, legal system, culture, and health system. Welcome to the A Little Less Fear podcast. Thank you very much for the invitation. Happy to be here. Yes, thank you for your time. So there was a lot on your, your bullets that I was reading here that we could discuss. And one topic that is of interest to me is should assistant suicide be legalized um, coming at the end of life? I've, I've often had people, I actually have a rare genetic disease called Muckowell syndrome. And there were times when I was in the hospital, I've had over 40 surgeries in 10 years. And there were times in the hospital, especially after using, losing my urinary bladder, when I, when I lost my ability to pee like a normal person, at 33 years old, I often thought to myself, what is my life going to be like with a progressive genetic disease like this? And is assisted suicide ever an option for me in the future? Should I come to a point where I just can't take it anymore? So I'm really uh, fascinated by this topic. I've even had people reach out to me on Instagram telling me that they wish, um, be based on their circumstances, that they wish that there was legal for them to have an assisted suicide. And um, I'm really curious to hear what you have to say on this topic. Well, what motivates my point of view is uh, the autonomy of the person. So for me, it's really, really important to know what the person wants. And it's important for me uh, that people would be able to be comfortable in their lives, in themselves, um, at the end of life. And if they so choose, they will be able to uh, have a suicide. That's something that is important to me. You may ask me, why should we bother other people. I mean, people who would like to take their own lives, they can do that. So why do you want the assistance from others? The simple answer to that is that many people are afraid to try and fail because then they might find themselves in even more horrible situation. And uh, because of this fear, especially say taking pills or jumping from something or whatever, um, and then they, they might be crushed even further than their situation at present. So they would like to have assistance. And, and because there is a certain profession called medicine, um, and these are professionals who know a lot about saving life and how to help people and how to reduce suffering. Um, and they use all kinds of medications and they know how to assess dosages of medication and so on. These professionals are the most adequate to help people in the case of need. At the same time, I am fully cognizant of the fact that because we are talking about life and death, there's nothing more precious than life of human being. Right. And I'm cognizant of the fact that there might be abuse and there's no point of return after, you know, the act has been done it's very difficult to reverse it you know you take a large dosage of, of lethal medication for instance uh, because of the fear of abuse uh, what i uh, done in my writings is to introduce the logic behind assist suicide or medically assist suicide or physician assist suicide but it comes with very detailed guidelines as how to do that in order to prevent abuse um, because I want people to really want to die. I don't think that we need to make it easy. You know, I'm horrified by all kinds of proposals by libertarians who said uh, we should have uh, off the counter pill. Anyone who wants to die can just buy it for $10 and go home and die. Mm -hmm. I'm completely horrified by such propositions because, um, you know, life are like a roller coaster. Sometimes yeah. we're up, sometimes we are down. 
we all of us experience periods of depression when we are not at our best and god forbid that in such a moment a person who decides to take in his life goes to the pharmacy buy this medicine and and go to sleep forever um i think that people really need to want it and to strive for it and to make an effort for it and what i perceive to myself is not young people is not healthy people we're talking about patients to be distinguished from people meaning people that are at the end of their lives they suffer from incurable diseases that medicine does not know at present how to cure we are not very good at that like all kinds of variants of cancer and for these people when the alternatives are either to be sedated and become zombies or to die and they decide listen that's not life for me anymore i uh, you know all the time just either suffering or sleep that's not me i don't want to live this anymore i'm 80 years old i've done my share I have a lovely family, I have grandchildren, I have children. I did all that I, that I wanted to do. Now I'm simply suffering. Please help me die. So these guidelines are, are geared towards these kind of people, these kind of patients at the end of life. And for them, I think we should not desert them. We should listen to them and provide them with solace to the best of our abilities because medicine does know how to relieve suffering. Mm-hmm. But sometimes people want to be still autonomous and the relief of suffering is not only that, but it's also, you know, not being burdened on the family, not being able to go to the toilet myself, not being able to wash myself, not being able to do all the necessary things that I would like to do myself. And besides that, I feel that I'm no longer me. And therefore, I don't want to be any part of this creation. I think this is something that uh, should be granted. And I speak about this as a right. I, I, I published a book back in 2001. It's about the right to die with dignity. Mm-hmm. The dignity of the person is extremely important to me as a liberal. And I think we should come to the assistance of such patients. Do you feel that the right to die with dignity is constrained within the boundaries of age or disease, or does it not matter? Does it also not matter whether it's caused psychologically versus physically? I don't think that age is the sole criterion. I said it in my mind, um, it has to be for patients who in advanced stages of their lives, so they are elderly, they, they live their life and so on. But of course, I'm fully, fully aware that you can be 85 years old and with full cognition and full of strength, and that you can be a wreck at the age of 40. Uh, so age in itself is not the criteria. It is one of the criteria that we need to uh, be cognizant of. Now you ask me another question about mental health and mm-hmm. mental psychological factors. Right, versus so illness or something physically that, that makes them yeah. incapable. So I'm speaking only about competent patients. Okay. Uh, I don't speak about incompetent patients. And this is because my fear of abuse. Mm -hmm. Because if you are no longer competent, then people can toy with you. People can do you all kinds of stuff and you won't be even aware of this. Um, And so the, the road for abuse is much wider if the person, the patient is no longer competent. So for me, this is a clear boundary. Uh, You provide a suicide only to competent patients and therefore patients with dementia, Alzheimer, all kinds of these uh, diseases, person who are um, uh, suffering from psychological pain, suffering, I exclude them from their assistance. I acknowledge that it's unfair to some of them that really want to die right but um you know when you are um legislating when you do laws the laws are for millions they're not for a single individual and no law is perfect so if i'll be able with the legislation with what i describe i'll be able to uh, find an answer to the very large majority of cases 
so be it. There will be some that are not going to be falling within the parameters of the law, but I don't want the law to open an avenue for a large number of people who do not want to die um, to be put to death. That's something that I dread. And that I'm assuming that that would also go within the boundaries of people who have schizophrenia or depression or yeah. having a major depressive disorder, some stuff in, along yes. those lines. I mean, this, you know, as you know, this, this uh, conditions, they are they're, they're in flux. They're not stagnant. Yes. And, you know, sometimes you speak to the person, it sounds totally logical, like you and me, and then you, you speak to that person again and after a day, and, and you see that, you know, it's not mental components. I mean, there's nothing there. Mm -hmm. So because of this fluctuation, I want to err on the side of life. For me, human life is extremely important, extremely important. I'm not a guru for death. Mm -hmm. I'm guru for life. Yes. However, I do understand that sometimes uh, life comes to an end. And if right. the patients want this sincerely, then we have to respect that decision, respect the dignity of the person and provide solace to that person. I don't think that we need to desert them or just to turn our back to them. Mm -hmm. We need to be answerable to them and we need to provide them with uh, the best that we can do in terms of care and medicine and whatever you have as an assistance. But sometimes we are short of that and the person still adamant, I want to die. We have to listen to that. So, okay, well, that makes sense. Um, I was thinking of a situation when I was in my early 20s, over 20 years ago, and I was in the hospital and I was hospitalized and I was sharing a room with an older gentleman in his 90s and he was wheelchair bound and he was hospitalized because he was trying to commit suicide and he tried twice, he slid his wrist, but they just kept taking him back to the hospital. And I remember at the time in my, my early 20s, I was kind of taken aback and I was trying to talk to this older gentleman and I was like, well, why? I don't understand why you're trying to end your life. And he said, well, my wife is dead. I used to have millions. I lost it all. I was in the war. My son is dead. He said, I have nothing else left. Tell me why I should live. And, and I seen his eyes and he just looked so tired and, and just exhausted. And I had no answer for him. And it's still to this day. I mean, I think about this gentleman, obviously he's most likely passed on by now, but I just wonder if there was a, a law that would allow him to exit is that considered an end of life if you're in your 90s and you're just done with life and you're just on a wheelchair does that constitute end of life this is a very tricky question um in the netherlands and belgium you know there are several countries not many but there are some countries that uh, legislate euthanasia uh, euthanasia is different from physician assisted suicide. The major difference between euthanasia and physician assisted suicide. You know what? Suicide... I'm sorry, doc, Dr. Almago. I'm at, I am confusing the both. So there is a there's a fine difference between the both. Oh yeah, and I am supporter of physician assisted suicide, and I'm adamant opposer of euthanasia. Okay, so I need to know the major difference here because I thought they were the same. Okay, so in physician assisted suicide. The physician prescribes lethal medication to the patient, and it can be in the form of a powder or some sort of a liquid. The patient himself mixes this lethal medication in yogurt or ice cream or something like that, and the patient eats the yogurt himself. So the last act is performed by the patient. That means the control mechanism is in the hands of the patient. The doctor provides the means, the patient does the act. And this distinction is extremely important. In euthanasia, the physician administer into the veins of the patients um, um, the means for that, and then he, he himself pushes the button or the syringe, and then the little medication goes into the body of the patient, and the last act is performed by the doctor by the physician okay of course if the patient doesn't have any control over that you can understand that the room for abuse is much larger yes. that the mechanism of control are in the hands of someone else not the patient himself right now i want to tell you that once upon a time when i started my journey instead the journey started in 1991 some years ago i supported both and then I went to the Netherlands, who at that time was the only country in the world that had euthanasia. 
and I came to the Netherlands as a supportive of euthanasia, but I heard horrific stories from physicians and others, and they were speaking to me as, you know, they speak about the weather, nothing extraordinary to them. But I almost fell out of my chair and lost my appetite just listening to them. And I came after an extensive trip for Netherlands, I entered into cognitive dissonance because for seven years or eight years, I supported euthanasia. I wrote in favor of euthanasia and so on. And then in witnessing all this evidence in front of my face, I said to myself, I honestly can no longer support this kind of system. There's too much abuse. So we need to introduce some guidelines, some safeguards to preserve patients. Otherwise, we are going to fall into the Dutch corner, which I did, do not like. Until today, I don't like what the Dutch are doing in terms of the end of life. Now, in these countries, in Netherlands and in Belgium, Belgium, Netherlands legislated euthanasia in 2002, and about six months later, Belgium also legislated euthanasia. So they, since 69, 1969, there was euthanasia in Netherlands without a law. And then in 2002, they decided to administer the, the legislative law, so it will be fine, legally speaking. Um, in both countries, we find situations which people are, are said to, to whoever, the, the doctor, I am tired of life, and therefore I want to die. This is the situation that you just asked me about. Yes. What do you do with people who are tired of life? Now, people who are tired of life tend to be old people. They live their life now, they... Most of the time, because they're elderly people, they are not, you know, they are not healthy. You know, it comes with age. You know, you lose all kind of functions sure. when you get older. Your body is is losing the some of the functions. So it's not that they're healthy at the age of eighty or ninety or whatever, but still they can go on for a number of years, maybe another five, six, seven, eight, nine years. I don't think that this in itself is a reason to die or to ask a doctor to kill you. I don't think so. I think that as long as you are able to die, to, to, to live, you should be able to live. Uh, instead of the language of death, we should speak the language of care. Mm -hmm. So to people like that, we try to see how can we help you? What is the silver lining? Mm -hmm. What is there that would prompt you to wake up in the morning and think I have a good day in front of me? Mm -hmm. I would like, I can be happy. What are these things? And, and do our best as society, as compassionate and caring society, to come to the help of these people and say, well, look, you know, there are birds in the sky. There is rainbow. There is sun. There is ice cream maybe you like. Maybe we can take you to a movie. Uh, when is the last time you saw your your grandchildren, right. is there anything that can help you believe in life and transform speaking to this kind of people? And, and I don't call them patients, I call them people. Yes. Transform the moods and, and let them hang on to life as long as it's possible. Again, I want to emphasize, I'm poor life. Yes. I'm not right. poor death. Mm -hmm. So the, this is, for me, death is the last resort after exhausting everything else that we can provide patients at the end of life in terms of care, compassion, the dignity of the person. That's in, in front of my eyes. And in front of your eyes, that's also seen as somebody who most likely has like a terminal illness, um, cancers metastasize and they're just in a lot of pain and they've got that option, correct? Absolutely. As is the case, for instance, in the state of Oregon, in the United States. You know that a number of states in the United States legislated physician assisted suicide. So yes. Oregon was the first, but now I think there are about 14 states of the United States that legislated some forms of assisted suicide. Um, and uh, on front of their eyes is this, this kind of patients, cancer patients. And the majority of people who would like to die suffer from cancer. Cancer is a very, very traumatic disease. It's extremely painful. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, we are not very good in controlling this kind of pain short of uh, making them unconscious. 
Right. So yes, we just knock them out. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, when you are either in a state of suffering or knocked out, there's not much that we can offer you as a society. And um, this is for them, unfortunately, that's the end of the tunnel. I'm not saying that we have to rush it. We have to exhaust, again, all the means that we have to help them. Mm-hmm. And death is the last resort. But when we see that we exhausted all other means and there's nothing but either to sedate them or let them suffer, we need to listen to them. But the decision, I emphasize, has to be of the patients, not the doctor. Yes, absolutely. Something you mentioned earlier was the potential for abuse going back to um, euthanasia. What, what types of examples can you give with abuse in regards to euthanasia? How much time do you have? We have um, about 10 more minutes. <laughs> well, I think the most horrific example that I can tell you, um, I, I came to Netherlands and I um, decided to do field work, meaning that I, um, I read about the Netherlands before coming to the Netherlands for five years. Okay? Okay. Um, I, I went to the Hastings Center in New York, which is the most extensive research center in the world for medical ethics. Mm-hmm. I sat there for six weeks and I just, like a, a, a thirsty man, drank all the literature that existed in English about the Netherlands. I think I read everything. So by the time that I came there, I knew a lot about the Netherlands. And I came to meet the people who are the directors, the people behind the policy and practice of euthanasia in the Netherlands. Mm-hmm. And I was able to identify them through their writings because I read their articles. And then I wrote to them and I said, I'm interested in euthanasia in the Netherlands and interested in what you're doing. Uh, would you be willing to grant me an interview? And the vast majority of them answer in the affirmative. So I had some 30 interviews. Um, uh, during the time in the Netherlands, with the cream de la cream of the Tunisia policy and practice. Mm-hmm. The person who wrote the law, the people who wrote the, the reports, the government reports, the people uh, in charge in the government on, on legislation on medical ethics, chairpersons of medical ethics uh, government uh, and uh, hospitals and universities, the whole lot. And I had dinner with one of the leading psychiatrists in the Netherlands. Um, And I knew him when he told me the story that I'm going to share with you now. I knew him for about 20 minutes. The first time that we ever met, we had some exchanges of emails before that, when we arranged our meeting. Um, we, We started the a chat uh, when we met in the restaurant at the Hilton in Amsterdam. Um, And it was a gentle chat. Uh, We ordered our steaks. Um, And then after 20 minutes or so of acquaintance, he told me the story. Mm -hmm. And the story is or was that his friend, a physician, unfortunately, um, his wife gave birth to uh, a son with uh, Down syndrome. And when the child was two, his friend killed the child because he thought that he doesn't have any prospects of life, decent life. And because he's a physician, he was able to disguise this as a natural death. Oh, wow. I lost my appetite while he was continuing eating. But I'm in the position of not a judge. I'm in the position of scholar who wants to interview people about the situation in the country. Mm-hmm. And I'm a foreigner in the country. I don't know the culture. I don't know. He's, he's part of the culture. So I was asking him, what do you think about it? Right. What do you think about what your friend did? Good question. And he continued to eat his steak and said, I would probably do exactly the same. Wow. Now. This is very revealing, and I emphasize that at that time, he knew me for 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. Netherlands was, I think, the seventh country. I did research now nine countries. I traveled the world in the, for this research. 
because it was very important for me to have uh, informed ideas of many experts from different parts of the world. So I think that was number six or seven on my list. So by that time, I met with dozens of physicians in all over the world. Mm -hmm. Nobody would speak to me like this. My friends who are physicians in England and in Israel would never tell me such things, even if they existed. They would never feel comfortable to speak like this to me. Mm -hmm. Now think that a stranger tells you right. this story as he's talking about the weather and you think this is okay. Right. That tells you that something endemic, something in the culture is wrong. Exactly. Okay, so that was just one example. But you know, it's it was a long journey. Uh, I spoke about euthanasia for morning, for morning until evening with all these experts speaking about death. Not the most jolly thing that you can do during the summer or any right. time. But I can tell you that from the, the word go, from the very first interview, just landed, went to Honingen to meet uh, a legal scholar, an expert in medical law. So I don't have to teach him about the law. And we're sitting in his garden, we're having lunch. And during his lunch, he tells me that sometimes the second opinion is conducted over the phone. Wow. And, and I almost fell out of my chair. This is the first interview for me as a researcher in Netherlands, and I'm speaking to a legal scholar. Now, why it's so important? Because according to the guidelines, the year is 1999, so there's no law. The law came in 2002, as I mentioned. But they had guidelines of the Royal Society, of the Dutch Royal Society. And the guidelines, the guidelines said very, very clearly that if a physician authorizes euthanasia, this euthanasia has to be approved by a second opinion of an expert in the field. So if it's cancer, it will be, you know, uh, in the field of cancer, if it's another disease, uh, an expert in that thing, in that disease. And the role of the second opinion is twofold. One, to verify that we are talking about end of life situation, the condition. And secondly, to verify that this is the voluntary will of the patient. Of the patient. Not under duress, not under any pressure. Mm -hmm. This is what the patient wants. Patient wants. Now he tells me the second opinion is performed by the phone. And he is a legal scholar, so he knows this information more than I do. My uh, he lives there. So I asked him, what do you mean by phone? Yeah. And the answer was, what do you mean, what do you mean? I said, well, who speaks with whom over the phone? And he says, the first doctor with the second doctor. Wow. I said, how can this kind of phone call is going to verify that Somebody's this is life. the voluntary will of the patient? My goodness. And then he started to tell me, well, you have to understand, Dutch is, Netherlands is a very big country. What are and, you talking about? Right, and? And because it's a big country, it's difficult to find someone in the region. So they have to call someone from afar. And that person in the far doesn't want to travel an hour or two hours because the Netherlands is such so big. Within two hours, you cover almost the entire country. But anyway, uh, so they conduct this discussion on the phone. And then, you no, know, I'm not judging. I'm a scholar asking him a question. I right. said, what do you think about this? <laughs> yeah. He said, that's absolutely fine. And I was horrified. What do you mean? So, oh, I, so I didn't say that I'm horrified. Myself. I'm telling you that I was horrified. Oh, so yeah. these are just two examples for you to understand the extent of abuse. Now, I, I also now. met with many American doctors. In the United States, you have another problem. And that problem is called money and insurance. <laughs> for and real. If yeah, for you sure. don't have the right insurance and you don't have the money, if euthanasia will become very easy, people may start to disappear. Wow. So we have to be very cautious about all kinds of pressures that can come to the fore and play a part. And therefore, I instituted in my guidelines, 19 guidelines that have to be satisfied, all of them, to warrant one case of physician-assisted suicide. So it has to be very meticulous. It's very, very bureaucratic. But I say, yes, I know it's very bureaucratic, 
But hey, we're talking about life here. Exactly. Life is precious. Oh, so yeah. I, yeah. I want to be bureaucratic. It needs to be bureaucratic. It cannot be easy. Wow, what an incredible subject. Thank you so much for educating me, our watchers, our viewers, and our listeners on the topic. And how can we find you if we need to get a hold of you? Uh, Rafael Cohen Almago, you Google me, you'll find me. Awesome. And your books, where are they available? Amazon. Uh, there's 19 books until now. And uh, my next book is about the peace process between Israel and the Palestinians. Why, despite the tremendous efforts of so many countries, including the United States, and billions of dollars, the two people, Israel and Palestine, are still fighting each other and unable to resolve the differences. That's an excellent topic, and I'm sure it's going to be an excellent book that's needed. Thank you so much for being on the Little Less Fear podcast with an incredible, intense subject. Thanks for educating me, our viewers, our watchers, and our listeners. And uh, let's keep in touch. Thanks so much for being on my show. Sure. That's you been take you. Care now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.